balance, please, from Capitalist and Anthropic. <laughs> what is the point of applying a bit of makeup when you grab people's faces in the dust? You mentioned Bill Gates. Fine. In my bag, I have some statistics of the fantastic number, the thousands of part time employment employed by Microsoft because they don't have to pay for care, because they don't have to pay for health, because they don't have to pay for anything that decent employers do. I've got a nephew who works with them kids, but I have those figures in there, and they are stunning. So there's always a hidden story. You mentioned the clothes you wear. I look at the clothes I wear. You don't know, they come from Egypt, from Argentina. Do we know what conditions they come in? When we wear our diamond ring, do we look at the diamond miners dying in Africa? Do we do all those things? None of us have the time or the energy to look into every semblance of exploitation. But believe me, every time we do, we find a hidden horror story. Now, I thought you were going to say something about free markets. So I took the precaution of making a, a, a few little um, observations. You see, I have a soft spot for free marketeers. Because if anybody is more unrealistic, <coughs> as he describes the Socialist Party, it's the free marketeers. Just think for a moment. With the best will in the world, it is difficult to see <coughs> how the exact same problems that bedevil us in the present capitalist society would disappear in a free market. The fundamental rules of the free market will have all the similar results of large numbers of people who are economic victims. For the essence of the free market philosophy is unrestrained competition. And as George Orwell rightly said, in a competition, somebody has to win. I've never understood the notion that vast and powerful private monopolies would in the same manner be more benign, in some manner be more benign than the vast, powerful state monopolies. Mm -hmm. Even libertarians admit it. There will always there, be some monopolies. Some of these will obtain and maintain a powerful position. Money does bring power. It's no use denying it. And of course, all kinds of smoke screens are employed to confusions. Differentiations are drawn between natural, artificial and state monopolies, and between monopolies and cartels. <clears throat> so one or the other might be more acceptable. Socialists, of course, consider all monopolies inquisitions. And I think that any libertarian who believes that somehow monopolist influence would be curtailed in a free market is severely misplaced. I remember something that the brilliant American satirist Walt Sarwan said. General Motors would buy Delaware if DuPont would sell it. That is the reality of the thing. Private monopolies grow at a vast rate. Just as much as socialists, libertarians depend on a change of consciousness to make sure these things don't happen in a free market. You can't rely on the market alone to do that. You would have to have people living with money, making money, building monopolies who are going to be so benevolent in their philanthropy that nobody will suffer. It just ain't true. They would have to be super saints, far more than us socialists who only want common ownership and a bit of sharing. <laughs> they would have to be super men to live in a money-generated, profit-motivated society <coughs> and be so all-consumingly kind. <coughs> I just want to mention something I did say before, which would touch also on something that Aidan said. <coughs> I mentioned it would be a money-less society. <coughs> and sometimes people ask socialists, how will I pay for my goods? And of course the answer is, you wouldn't. As a participant in that society, 
of social society, playing your part in producing what is needed, you would have free access to whatever you require. But, they say, wouldn't people take more than they needed? <coughs> was actually necessary. Well, at least they would say money may engender some restraint in this matter. <coughs> and possibly at first people might take more, but it would be a pointless exercise because what they do with it. And here's the point I want to make, the difference, illustrating the difference, the merits of free access to money. Some 50 years ago, <coughs> I had occasion to be um, uh, receiving of the hospitality of Her Majesty for several months. And I was in an open prison. There were no doors, there were no walls, we had cupboards with no locks. Everything was open, and it was fine. Now, we all had our mugs, we all had our knives and forks, we all had our little things, and if we wanted we broke a mug, we'd go to the store and get a new one. Nobody deliberately broke mugs. Nobody had six mugs. <laughs> <laughs> what happened then? An edict was issued saying that due to a high amount of breakages, which was unacceptable, we would have to pay for our marks. An outbreak of thieving swept through the prison. <laughs> Free access, no problem. Money comes into the equation, absolute disaster. The fact is that if I am living in a reality, Eamon, then so are you. Because the free market would depend as much on a dramatic change of consciousness as socialists would. Here, I think we have common ground because we want to see a change of consciousness in human beings, don't we? I think we do. And the question that I'm going to raise at the end is the thing I most want to talk about now the possibility of a change of consciousness, whether we should lose hope about that possibility. So that's all that I want to say in my little bit of sum up. I'll let you judge who is the realist and who isn't. Thank you. Yes, or the reality of how things are just about managed to function for some people nowadays. Yes, and I think the Socialist Party is going to be treated as a sensible uh, body is going to have to start resolving those questions. Yeah. How is it going to happen? Okay. You see, you have some funny ideas about us as well. First of all, we're not divorced from reality. We go to work, we belong to unions, we fight our forces for better pay, we stand against people who try to um, do an injustice to others or to ourselves. We do live in the real world. The point about having an ideal like socialism <coughs> is it informs the way we approach this world. It is the reality for us now. As a socialist, how I look at how people behave, how I see the world, how I look at the potential of their consciousness is transformed. Now you say we have no plan. Well, we cannot plan for something so far ahead of us. But what we do do is try to practice the things in our own way that we want to see happen. If you come along to the Socialist Party meetings like this, there's no censorship. There is no authority and control. We've got a chair, but he's pretty useless as an authority. <laughs> <laughs> um, not as a chair, but as an authority. <laughs> Um, we try to practice, and we've had a, a great deal of struggle in trying to make as perfect as possible a democratic process within our party. All our meetings are open. We do plan within our own sphere. Of course, we plan this meeting. We put up posters. We arrange speakers. We can only do what we can do now. That is the reality. Again, I don't want to impinge on what I want to say at the end is what I really feel but, um, about, about that kind of problem. But, of course, we, well, how can we make a blueprint for the, for the future? My very favourite definition of utopia, which I have on my wall and have had there for years, was given by a lovely gentleman called Phil.